first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Valerie, first, we want to thank you for being part of the Northeast uh, Métis Storytelling Project. Um, as you know, this is a project that basically involves sharing stories from elders, and but not just stories, wisdom, uh, or any teachings that you want to pass along to anyone that perhaps you may know or you don't know. That's the beauty of it. Uh, basically why this project is being done is so that when generations pass, we still get to hear from them uh, in the future, okay? Um, so with that in mind, let's start with the basics. Can you please tell us your first and your last name? My name is Valerie Pace. Okay, and uh, do you have any middle names? My middle name is Jean. Okay, and uh, can you tell us maybe about your first name? Do you know if you were named after someone uh, or any stories behind it? Not that I know of. I was actually born Valerie Jean Martin. So that's my, my real name. Gotcha. Okay, so then Martin would be then your family name? Yes. On your uh, mom and dad side? My dad's side. Dad's side? Yes. Okay. Do you know any history of the Martin last name? Oh, yes, I do. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, I think they, well, I know they originated down in uh, North Dakota. Uh, there's a lot of Martins on Turtle Mountain Indian Reserve. They came up through North Dakota into the bottom part of Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba. And that was Chief Sitting Bull's band. My dad's granny is Chief Sitting Bull's granddaughter. And uh, it's, they, mingled in with the uh, Cree and the Ojibwe and Chippewa and uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. And what about your mom's side? On my mom's what side? What would be the last name there? McKay. Okay, and do you know any history there? Yes, I do. Uh, down in Saskatchewan and Manitoba again, uh, as I'm a direct descendant from Red River, uh, my family name McKay, they were um, usually spoke three to four languages each in the home. They were also uh, very instrumental with the Hudson's Bay Company in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, acting as interpreters, uh, guides, and taking them through from uh, Manitoba all the way to British Columbia. I even have uncles that are in uh, the, the uh, social studies books. Anybody that's a McKay in there, that would be our family coming through. And uh, just like on the Martin side, they started actually in Maine and migrated over and came through. So we've been all across Canada. Wow, that goes yeah. pretty far. See, and that's why we ask about the lineage of the last names because you yeah. get some cool stories. That's really cool. And um, what were you, so your parents, what would they have been as far as uh, the uh, cultural group goes? Like they would have been uh, Beaver or anything, or sorry, Cree, Dene, or Beaver, or neither of those? Cree. Cree? Yes. Okay. And uh, you yourself growing up, did you guys speak Cree uh, yes. uh, at home? Yes. Is that your first language? Uh, Cree, French, Mischief, and then English last. And most of our families were like that. 
Um, we have a lot of other nationalities that have been in our families. So we learn those languages just like German, high German, low German, whatever. Uh, there's a lot of that in the families. Um, I have Scottish in me, Irish, French, and Cree. Sue Cross. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I'm a Canadian Métis. <laughs> That's cool. And maybe let's pump it back even a little bit before that, if you know any information. Your grandparents, you talked about them a little bit on your dad's side. Yes. Uh, do you know a little bit of their background as well? Uh, well, from what I learned from the history books and from what uh, the storytelling that gets passed down from generation to generation about when uh, Chief Sitting Bull came over the border and uh, stayed there, he was actually um, not a chief, I was told. He was actually a medicine man. And um, he had five wives, and we are from the lines of those five wives. He had uh, quite a large family. And, and that's on the Martin side. That's on the Martin side. And uh, all the heritage that goes with it. We have a lot of medicine people in our family. And uh, my dad, uh, when we were growing up, because he did medicines, he taught my older brother and myself uh, and took us in the bush because we grew up north in northern Manitoba. We weren't in big cities. So uh, he taught, gave us a life lesson in the bush with medicines and trees and our growing up uh, in there. And, and uh, we grew up very traditionally. And uh, we lived on the lakes with canoes. We did our fishing there, uh, trapping. We helped our dad with uh, the traps, um, hunting, gutting, skinning, um, cutting meat. Um, making our own, uh, uh, well, it would be grease or lard then, uh, and uh, it's just we didn't have to go into stores. We were very self-provided. We were a family of eight. Wow. And what about on the McKay side? Did you get to meet those grandparents? Yes, I did. Actually, I got to stay with both sets of my grandparents. In our family, in the Cree uh, nation, uh, we were... The grandparents ma mainly raised us uh, with their traditions and their cultures. So I got to live with both sets of grandparents, as did my siblings. And uh, we learned a lot about our cultural and heritage and uh, just survival skills, cleaning, cooking, uh, anything that had to be done. And uh, we're taught about what our family did years ago for the Hudson's Bay Company and coming through. and. The kinship and how they are all related coming down into BC from Manitoba. Well, actually, probably from Quebec to Man uh, to BC, and uh, it's a, quite a large family. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. And that leads perfect into the next thing I was going to ask you. I think you already mentioned it, mentioned it though. Uh, you're one of eight. Yes. Correct. Yes. And where are you in that? I'm the second one. First girl born, uh, second child. Second child. Yeah. Okay. And what was that like? Well, it's a big responsibility because the older ones do everything. <laughs> it's not that we do everything. The little ones are too young and small to do it. So it's a big responsibility and the parents start teaching us and our grandparents right away on our skills and what we should have as skills and how we can survive and teach it down to our siblings and cousins, etc., that are younger than us. Now, the um, <clears throat> as far as teaching you the first things that, you know, because you're sort of higher up in the hierarchy, what were some of your duties and responsibilities growing up? Uh, making sure the children were always in eyesight, making sure they were clean and fed all the time. So the first things we learned to do was bake bannock. And after we baked bannock, we dried fish or had meat drying or whatever, but uh, uh, the children were always fed and watched very carefully by everybody and not just in your family unit, but everybody that was around in that little area, they all watched each other's children. Now, did you enjoy having all those responsibilities? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I love family. I love children. Um, I really enjoy uh, family life and nurturing and trying to put good values down into the younger siblings. And... Um, why don't we start then maybe um, tell us a little bit about when you were born. Do you know, have you heard any stories 
uh, of wh when you were born or is there anything that has been passed down to you about that? Yes, um, I was born up in Lynn Lake, Manitoba and you couldn't get in there. There's no roads. There is now, I heard, but dad got in there by dog team. We had a, a team of Malmutes and that's how we used to get in and out of uh, Lynn Lake and get to places like Sheridan or Kissasine where we have family in there and then down in the, the Paw, Flint, Lawn, Thompson area, uh, Cranberry Portage. Um, so that's, uh, we, we've got to get out like that. And then one of my uncles had a plane, so he might fly us in sometimes in the summertime because you can't run a dog team in the wintertime. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how we grew up living for a while. And uh, it was a great life. Like it's very simple and refreshing and you could, uh, you were free, you could do anything. So you, after you were born, your family stayed there for a while? Yes. Okay. Yes, I had another sibling born in Lynn Lake. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then where did you guys go? Uh, from Lynn Lake, we went into the Paw, where I had another sibling born. <laughs> okay. And how old were you at that point? I think I was around eight. Okay. And uh, so we had, we looked after the younger ones. Uh, dad had to move around a lot so for work. Uh, sometimes it was hard for him to get work and sometimes it wasn't. He was uh, very talented and very smart, but uh, sometimes when you live up north, it's uh, um, there could be a little bit of prejudice. Yep, and yeah. it still exists today. And it still exists and it was very hard to get jobs. Uh, it didn't matter what your qualifications were when they looked at you because my dad was very dark. Fair enough. Yeah. And so when you moved to the Paul then, did you begin to attend school or were you attending school before that or were you just fully at home? Uh, we went up to Thompson for one year. There was a nickel mine up there and uh, they closed and we stayed in there and in the Paw, uh, we started school in there and um, that's when they were doing uh, residential schools and sometimes they had day use and so my older brother and I were in those schools and uh, we stayed there for a while but they didn't know what to do with us because we were listed as half-breeds. There was no other terminology for us. There was no Métis and so because we didn't fit in one world and didn't fit in the other they politely excused us out of those schools after about a year. Really? Yes. See, this is why we. This is why we're recording these stories. Yes, that's incredible. Same as I can't believe that. When my dad was in the war, he was in World War II, and he was a sniper, and he was in two different things, and they had him listed, and I have his papers as this intelligent half breed, and I have that documented from the government, and because they had no other terms for us, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess back then. A lot of things just, you know, it's easier to make comments about it later, but they were just addressing it in the best terms that they could. And that's what they knew. So, you know, if they didn't know any better, that's how it came out. And that's how everybody used the terminology. And so did you attend another school after that? Uh, yes. Dad got us finally into a big city and that was not scary, but it was different. We were in, uh, we moved to Regina because he got a big job as building a um, big mall. My dad reads blueprints. He taught my older brother and I to read blueprints. Um, and we did all the math and everything with him in, besides going and attending school. And uh, he, um, yeah, when we went in school, it was tough in there because we weren't very accepted when we went into those city schools. Similar experience to the PAW or very different? Uh, similar experience to the PAW. And uh, so we went there, but we basically had to fight our way through the school. And then after about two to two weeks to three, they left us alone. So when we'd walk into there, they'd just divide and my older brother and I would walk because uh, we're all buffed up from coming out of the bush. <laughs> These are city kids. <laughs> so that was kind of funny, but Thinking of the paw, and I have to tell you, we went into a movie in a, in a movie theater in there, and it was really exciting for us because we never got to go into a movie theater. They kept us in a box in the middle of the movie theater, and it was full and around, and they had Caucasian people in there, and there could be one or two sitting there, but we were not allowed to go out of that box. 
And that's where they kept us in the box. And we were standing. We never had seats. We were lucky to be in there. No seat? No, we loved it because that's where the natives went. See, they didn't, uh, that's where the, na in uh, the theater, that's where you went. And, but we were just happy to sit there and watch a movie. It was exciting to watch a movie. You didn't think anything of it. Now that I think about it years later and I'm thinking, wow, do these guys know what they were doing to us? <laughs> yeah, and that's why I'd say looking at it now, it's yes. know, ludicrous that that yeah. was even happening. But those were the times. Yeah, they were. And I think a lot of people grew up like that. And then when you get out into the city, you have the old stigma. Oh, that's, they didn't know the difference between, uh, they'd call us Indians or half-breeds. There was no such thing as Métis. And if there was, where do they belong? There was, uh, and, and it's still like that nowadays. People don't know the, the culture and the history. And we have a very rich history and culture. Yes. I guess it, it has taken a bit of time to fully understand the two because, I mean, to, to understand the, the Métis, the Beaver, the Dene, I think what, what where people maybe stopped and for a lack of a, who knows, in, we want to assume interest out of niceness, uh, but just like you, you know, with French people or, you know, or other like European people, you would ask, you know, but yeah. what part? But it's almost like that didn't translate when it well, came into, uh, like now we would then group as First Nations, but now we obviously make the effort to do it. Now, was that weird having to navigate that back then? Uh, no, I perceived that as they didn't think we were educated and they didn't know how to communicate with us. And they did see that each uh, native group had structure. We had great structure. We had no issues within our, our bands and things like that. And uh, until we started uh, ass assimilating in with the, the whites and coming through and then some of the problems carry through and things like that. And I, uh, I think they just didn't understand. And I remember dad telling me years ago when we were young, and I remember him saying that, uh, that education is the key to success. So we made sure we got out into the schools, finished our grade 12, and proceeded on from there. And we kept on going. And um, Where did you end up going after high school? After high school, I came up here. Well, we went into uh, Kamloops and then came up to Hudson's Hope. I've been here 45 years. And uh, I went to the college in Prince George, did four years there, and went into the universities. And what did uh, you take? I became a social service worker. Um, I'm certified actually in 12 different areas. And um, I've been at the school, and uh, my specialty actually is behavior, severe behavior disorders. And I work with special needs and uh, can do darn near about anything. <laughs> Have taught yourself along the way. I've been down at the school for 30 years. Uh, I've been a city councilor here for 14 years, so I've gotten into law and uh, and how everything works, uh, public works, everything like that. So I'm well versed on uh, life, I guess. And yeah, and then I've been here at the Métis Society about 15 years. As you were going through those phases of gaining education and seeing that you were equally capable as other Caucasian people of, mm -hmm. you know, comprehending and understanding all these things. With you being able to comprehend and understand and do everything that a Caucasian person can do, pump, I guess, the clock back a few years, were you still seeing uh, maybe not full out racism, but were they prejudiced towards you, even though you were fully educated? Uh, I've run into that a few times. and. Uh, chose to ignore it or address it just depending on the severity of it. Um, uh, especially when you're sitting in a restaurant and don't get served. And that still does happen. And to this day it's happened too. Oh yes. And uh, my younger brother was with me and we were in a restaurant. and There was only another table in and the waitress kept going over there but we weren't served and we sat there for half an hour. So I went up and got our own menus and I waited and she never came. So I went and ordered from the cook. I knew right away what was wrong. And I said, and if your waitress has a hard time to serve us, I will get the water and I will set the table and I just ding your bell and I'll get our meal. And that's what he did. And uh, Oh, he agreed to that? Yep, yeah, and he did that. And we ate and uh, my brother and I ate and he didn't understand. My brother was deaf and um, 
so he didn't understand, but he does now. And do you mind if I ask where this was? No, it's, it was in BC somewhere. <laughs> but uh, things like that still happen, little things here and there, and people just, uh, and I, I feel sorry for them because they don't really understand, and it's a circle they've come from that hasn't been broken, and that's what they've been taught, and it keeps going back and back, and if you don't break the circle, it never will get broken, and uh, it's just like they're stunted in their growth mm -hmm. mentally. And once they get ahead of that, then they start proceeding and succeeding in life. What about in the professional realm? Did you run across situations where you had to confront them? Uh, not so much. Like I was an RCMP victims assistance worker. I ran a crisis line for four years. I was hands-on type person and went out. I think I was appreciated quite a bit uh, when I did go out and and uh, do what I was supposed to do, and, and I like to think I was very good at it. Never got shot or stabbed. <laughs> Must have been okay. <laughs> but um, I, you recognize that right away, and I have very high observation skills, and I listen and watch people's uh, postures, so you know right away if you're accepted in or not or whatever, and, and I think once they... Um, they don't see you going above your station. A lot of people are very generous and not like that. You only run across the odd one like that, and you'll find that it's it comes from the house. It doesn't come, you know, you just don't wake up one day and it's there. No. So it's And it's something that has to be worked on, and I think it'll be worked on for a long time because even though they appreciated people like, say, my father in the war and going out in that, he wasn't really appreciated when he came home and had to struggle for his family and try and get jobs and turned away from housing projects and have to live in cheaper ones or older ones because you weren't accepted to get into the better ones with other people. They didn't see you as a, an equal. And I think a lot of people see you as equals now. Yep. See, and that's the unfairness that it's sort of that prejudice that happens without even getting to know someone. And it was really backwards back then. It was people were only willing to lower that prejudice once they got to know someone. But, you know, that should never really be the case. No, but that's Canada. And that, you know what? That's growing pains that Canada has. And not only Canada, the states and all over. Everybody has their own. And uh, I think as Canada grows, hopefully we're such uh, a multicultural nation that things will maybe come better. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about maybe your... Can we go back to your parents, if that's okay? What did they do uh, for a living growing up? You mentioned a few jobs that your dad had. Uh, my dad was uh, worked in the mines for many, many years because he comes from a family of 13. And he was the oldest son. And so he had to support. And each one of the brothers came and worked. They used to laugh because one whole shift was brothers. <laughs> it's a big family. <laughs> but you know what? It supported the family. And... Uh, I remember him telling me stories of how he used to hunt moose and he only had two 22 shells. He could kill a moose with a 22. And these guys, he used to laugh at these hunters that go out with great big guns. <laughs> but it's, uh, and grew up because he had to feed his family. And um, his mother was a, a single mother with many children because his dad had passed away. Yeah. What about your mom? My mom comes from a family of five children. And uh, there are no children, one, one left now, but um, they grew up in a smaller community in Saskatchewan, Long Last Mountain Lake, it's called Regina Beach. And um, it's the Muscopiton Reserve that goes from the bottom all the way up into Manitoba. And uh, I, she had a quite, a, quite a similar life. My mom was very fair, um, she, uh, kind of a reddish blonde hair, very pale skin and green eyes. My dad is, I have my dad's coloring, but he was darker. Yes. So we kind of divided the family half and half. So as people used to say, is that your real parents? Like, are, <laughs> yes, those are our parents. <laughs> what about uh, your mom? Did she uh, look after the kids or did oh, she yes. go out to work? No, she was a stay at home mom in, uh, I don't know if it was that generation. Uh, my mom never even had a driver's license. And uh, she stayed home, she cooked, she cleaned, she looked after the children. That was a, her big responsibility. Dad went out to work and us older kids helped the best way we could. 
Are there any stories that have stuck to you to this day of your childhood? Anything that you think maybe was, was special? Well, I used to like going out on the lakes a lot, fishing. And uh, we had pickerel. And my brother and I would jump in the canoe on Friday and come back on Sunday. I don't know what our parents were thinking. They never knew where we were. <laughs> we're out on the lake with every, you know, come back with a bunch of fish and, and uh, things like that. And it's good when you have quality time with your siblings and you're doing stuff that you enjoy and love in life. And the love of the land and what you can produce off there is, uh, it's tenfold. Like it's, it's, it's actually amazing and you carry that through you with your, with your mind and heart and you share it if you can with other people. Correct. Now let's talk about later on uh, as an adult. Um, <clears throat> did you end up uh, getting married and having kids? I did get married and I have one child. I didn't get married till very late in life. And uh, while well, they thought it was late, they were quite a shock. I got, I got married and had a baby at 30. That was a shock then. <laughs> now everybody has them want 40, 45. <laughs> and uh, I raised her and taught her the best that I could and in this small town here, which she loves. And she's still here in the small town with her children. And uh, they just, it seems they like that type of atmosphere. They have been out into cities and back and forth, but uh, they always come back for the small town. Yeah. Now, who would you say as an, like at this point in your life as an adult, who would you say influenced you the most? My dad. And why is that? My dad loved me for anything that I did and was proud of me for everything that I did. Uh, I tried very hard and if I didn't succeed, I would, I'm pretty stubborn. I'll do it and do it again until I get it right. And uh, he taught me core values. He taught me our heritage. He taught me medicines. Uh, he taught me just what it is to be have love in a family, no matter what's outside that and what people think of you. As long as you love yourself and you love your family, that's all you need in life. And would you say there were um, any other elders that you met along the way or any other figures in your life that you admired or appreciated that influenced you? Well, I lived with both my grandmas and uh, any elder brings knowledge and experience, any elder that you have. And they, along with that, they bring their stories and you sit and you listen and you grow up and you can tell your children, your cousins, your nieces, your nephews, whatever. And uh, my granny who was by herself raised 13 children while uh, dad was in the war and so he went and lied about his age actually got in because he was younger than what they were taking and got a check and then sent the check home to grandma so she would have money for the children to feed and i remember him saying and it was on his papers he ran away for three days and he went to check and help his mom and shoot a moose because they were hungry and had no food and he shot a moose and then he went back into uh, the army and uh, he worried because it's a big responsibility when you're older and you have many brothers and sisters and you're trying to help feed them getting food on the table big project yes having these people i guess in your life and they've obviously influenced you do you find yourself doing things a particular way because of how they taught you to do certain ways or any traditions that you still keep alive oh yeah <laughs> can you tell us about some I'm I'm like my dad and mom, I can see it. And, and my daughter will say, you're just like grandma. <laughs> and I've said, what, I became my mom? <laughs> when did that happen? So what things is she particularly referring to? Well, just wait, I'm an early riser. Our parents are early risers. We get up five every morning with her and, and start puttering uh, because not puttering. When I grew up, we had I had to get the wood stove ready and the water reservoir. and and uh, get the house warmed up and, and mom's packing lunches and getting stuff done and, and things like that because sometimes you didn't have running water and power. So uh, sometimes we're in a tent, sometimes you're in a house, it just depends. Um, and uh, it's just, it's, you know, life's a big learning process and your parents are the best teachers you're ever going to have in life. And I wish uh, I could tell my parents that. Did they pass on any traditions, like any Métis traditions down to you that you still do to this day? My grandpa used to play the bagpipes 
and we played, we had a lot of fiddle players in our uh, family. So we played the fiddle, we played the guitar, we played the banjo, we sang, we had family groups, they'd come out all with the family, all the children, it's not like you're segregated or anything, and would sit there all night, uh, I guess not partying, but uh, just having a good time with music and, and uh, just having a great time, and that's how we grew up, and uh, again, family time and loving people, yes. And have you passed any of those traditions perhaps down to your children? Oh, yes. For music? I love music. I have many children. I actually had uh, 20 foster children and 17 boys and three girls and uh, they all, I love children and uh, I love big families and uh, if you keep them busy at home, uh, whether they're learning on the farm or how to plant a garden or cooking or cleaning or doing whatever, uh, we didn't need TVs, we didn't have TVs, uh, radio we had, but uh, you keep yourself busy and you work it together as a family unit. I think that's all you need. Family life in general, as far as um, being able to recall maybe any big changes or upheavals that stick out to you in your mind at this point? Do you recall any that you would say were major? <laughs> we moved a lot. And the reason we moved a lot is because my younger brother, who was two years younger than me, was deaf. And in those years and days when you were deaf, they used the word, oh, he's retarded. And he wasn't. That's the words they would use. So somebody would come and want to put him in a home because they used to put them in homes. And uh, so we moved a lot so we could keep him with us. He spoke his first word when he was 11. We used to use the old Simpson Sears catalog and Eaton's catalog, and we'd point with them endlessly. We'd all take turns with him till he started talking and getting his vocals. And he said his first word at 11. He's uh, exceptionally brilliant. Um, when I left home, I took him with me just to make more space for the younger kids. And uh, it was wonderful. It was... Uh, it was a, a good life experience to be with, with somebody that you loved, like your brother, and uh, not take care of him, but he reciprocates and takes care of you. There was nothing wrong, he just couldn't talk, so we learned sign language. So now I'm a sign language instructor. <laughs> so what would you say has helped you get through all the difficult times? Uh, I pray a lot. The power of prayer helps me get through difficult times. My family helps me get through difficult times. Because nothing uh, binds stronger than a family that notices one is struggling and they all try to help. And uh, I think a lot about my parents and probably what they would do and maybe how they would solve that problem and sit there and think about it and, and try and do what they have done. Was your faith in God passed on to you from your parents? Was that yes. You no, we, had, uh, we went to church a lot and... Uh, from the days that we were in those schools and you go to church and, and uh, yeah. Good, and that's helped you a lot during the, the tough times? Difficult times, yeah, it has at difficult times. Because sometimes when you think you have no hope and you have nobody, there is somebody there. How would you say specifically that it's helped you, aside from prayer? It helped, it's uh, made me rethink my situation. And just when you think things are bad and couldn't get any worse, sometimes they do. <laughs> And sometimes they get better. So it just depends on um, how, they're, how, it, how things play out in life. Life is funny. It's like a, a game. And when you roll the dice, you don't know what you're going to get. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, your involvement in the community. You've been here for 40 years plus, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Um, I think you, earlier on you were telling us you were a city councillor, but have you volunteered? Uh, numerous organizations. You said you were part of victim services as well, or you worked for them? Um, I used to for uh, three years, and I, I ran the crisis line here. I started a crisis line okay. with my girlfriend. We did that for four years under the umbrella of Healthy Communities. Mm -hmm. um, I sit on uh, with the city council. I've been on for 14 years in that. I work at the school as an Indigenous uh, school, student support worker and youth care worker. And I've been there 32 years doing that. Um, let's see what else. I've been uh, the president of the Métis here for about 15 years. And I uh, like to take a break here and there, but don't get it. 
<laughs> and uh, in the community, I was uh, the founder of uh, the Fall Fair. And so that's been continued on, I'm sure, 28 years. And uh, we revitalized the uh, Christmas parade, which I thought every town needs. Lights, I love Christmas lights. So lights and a parade, and uh, even with times of COVID now, you just have to reorganize and uh, redo what you're doing. And why do you do it? I do it because I love my community. Um, I volunteer on quite a bit of things here in the community. And I do it because I like to see the children growing up healthy. I like a healthy community. And I want the children when they're older to remember what they had as they were growing up. And it's nice because the community here is only about 1,200 people. And uh, so if somebody's struggling, you can go out and you can help them. And so it's not so bad anymore. So. Well, that's nice. Seasons in general. What do you remember of uh, each season as far as what it was like for your family growing up and then your family as an adult? Like what was winter like? What was summer like? Oh, okay. Uh, winter was... Um, you stayed closer to home because you had everything in. Fall was the busiest, spring and fall, because in the spring you're planting, you're, you're checking out where the bulrushes are to get the potatoes and things like your, your things from the earth. And in the fall you harvest everything. And then when you harvest things and you go and shoot the moose or the deer, what you have to can it, you have to dry it, you have to dry your fish. It's a big project in the fall time getting enough firewood in, uh, getting all your wood in so everything's heated, um, making sure you have enough provisions, and especially if somebody comes along and uh, maybe wants to stay with you for a while, family member or somebody, or it gets lost or damaged or things like that. So you just basically work, I guess, year round. I love fall time because of the colors and uh, harvesting the medicines because you can harvest all the medicines in the fall time. Yeah, so you're talking about how your family, uh, your grandparents, uh, had a lot of knowledge when it came to medicine. Do you practice any of that today? Oh yeah, I go out and I've taught my grandson and my daughter some. I uh, go and harvest all the medicines. I use a lot of the medicines still. I have a book this thick with pictures that I drew with the medicines and what you can use it for and how to make the tea um and things like that i still am very active with harvesting medicines and uh, showing people and sometimes i do classes where i will take people for a walk on a hike in the bush and just show them what's around at their disposal right there and uh, after all all our medicines come from plants do they not so yeah what about hunting you guys mentioned you went fishing did you go hunting too oh, yes we're great Hunters, fish, you have to if you need Do you meat. still to this day? Uh, I haven't for the last year, and, and uh, hopefully the younger ones will take it up and, and uh, start hunting. But I haven't hunted for a while, but I certainly miss the meat. <laughs> but in your adult years, you yourself would go on hunting? Oh, yeah. With animals? Yeah, or I'd hunt by myself and bring a deer home and uh, hang it up and gut it and skin it and cut it up and you've got your meat and you've got your garden that you plant in the spring and, and uh, yeah it's nice being self-sufficient yes that's really cool before we I guess end the interview is there anything that perhaps you want to um, pass on to future generations if you could pass on a message what would you say value your family value your time with the family and learn about the earth all around you as you're growing because that will provide for you that's what I would say well thank you Valerie I really appreciate all the stories and wisdom you passed on thank you for being part of the Northeast Métis storytelling project uh, we know many people will appreciate it and hopefully some of your family members will get to see this someday so thank you you're welcome thank you for having me